give a warm welcome to the Reverend Matthew Kesson. Hi, everybody. Hello. The screen's coming down. <laughs> It'll be fun when it gets all the way down. Actually, we can start without it. Hi, I'm Reverend Matt, and tonight we are going to talk about speculative evolution. Now. Those who have seen my show before know that I deal only in facts, that I am a man of science. The word science is right there in the name of my series, What More Proof Could Anyone Possibly Need? But, if you will indulge me for a moment, and if you will indulge me for a moment by giving me better light on my script... <laughs> uh, I could use some more light if you would be so kind. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, I'll plow on to the left. Um, if you'll indulge me for a moment, just right here at the beginning, I would like to leave tonight with a personal story. Okay? Um, <laughs> it's a supportive community here at Fearless. There we go. I would like to leave tonight with a personal story of the sort that are quite popular in the storytelling performance community, I'm led to understand, for reasons, for reasons that are, of course, totally incomprehensible. In 2017, I put together a Monster Science group show, a Monster Science Ensemble, on the theme of dinosaurs. And among my performers was the extraordinary local band, the Dino Birds, who sang, song about, sang songs about dinosaurs just before the intermission, and then again at the end of the show. Some time later, one of the members of that band, the brilliant Anna Wiggle, Anna, Anna Wiggle, told me that she had been contacted by a member of that evening's audience who told her that they had loved the Dino Birds, and indeed that knowing that they were going to be closing the show was the only reason they stuck around to the end of it. <laughs> you wow. see, they were, Anna was told, Christians who believed that the earth was 6,000 years old oh. and had been made very uncomfortable with all the evolution content in a, sto in a, in a show about dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> to these people, I can only say, I'm sorry, and by I, I'm sorry, I of course mean die in a fire. <laughs> If you want, but you don't get dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are for us. You get the federal government, apparently. Oh. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Perhaps my very clever and physically attractive audience has divined why I am bringing all of this up. Tonight, we will be talking about evolution. And if evolution displeases you, this is not the show for you. <laughs> Please take advantage of Monster Science's standard refund policy of haha, -ha, no. <laughs> I don't know, sitting on the couch smiling vacuously at nothing in particular, or whatever it is creationists do for fun. <laughs> Alright, that out of the way, I am going to presume that those of you who remain understand that evolution is real, but don't understand how it works exactly necessarily. Now, now that the creationists have exited, I can reveal to you its mechanism. Are you ready? Yes! yes. Satan! <laughs> I make gentle sport, of course. In fact, Darwin's theory is the theory of evolution by natural selection, and it's really quite simple. Occasionally, newborn animals mutate, which is to say have traits that their parents lack, longer limbs or different colors or an appreciation for auto-tuning. <laughs> <laughs> or to put that joke another way, this music, this music the kids listen to today is nothing but a bunch of dang noise, not like in our day. Ha! <laughs> Usually in nature, these mutations are disadvantageous, and the mutant, no, <laughs> dies early as a result, but sometimes it's the other way around. The mutation gives the animal an edge. It lives longer, and hence breeds more, and its mutation passes on to its offspring, which are similarly advantaged, and hence pass their genes on until finally, after generations, the descendants of the original animal are sufficiently different from their ancestors to be a new species. And that is evolution. What's heartbreaking about this is that I have now just expo explained evolution in less than 60 seconds in simple terms using observed phenomena such as mutation and the passing on thereof and the perfect logic that advantageous mutations would pass on. And yet we're having this national debate about this. It is almost as if some people are actively avoiding learning at all. <laughs> 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 
Though that is, of course, insane. I am going to stop complaining about creationism for, let's say, five minutes at least, so that we can move forward with evolution. There are a number of principles within the concept, and we will be getting to those, but one important one to get out of the way is that evolution is not a matter of advancement. There is no tendency toward greater intelligence, or size, or dangerousness, or spooky mental powers, in spite of what 1950s and 60s science fiction movies may have told you. Of course, who are we to talk? We just made the Meg. <laughs> An animal evolves what it needs to survive in its environment, nothing more. Any feature not strictly necessary will be generally selected out of existence due to that feature's need for energy to grow or use, and the conservation of energy is, of course, always advantageous. Horseshoe crabs, or animals very much like them, have existed for 450 million years, and if evolution was about it, yeah, give it up for 450 <laughs> And if evolution was about advancement, they would be shooting mind rays at us from their cities on the surface of the sun by now. Of course, maybe they are. There are stupider conspiracy theories. Just because I've just now made it up doesn't make it wrong. So what evolution actually does is respond to changing conditions. Continental drift, erosion, changing river courses, mass extinctions of various kinds, and all sorts of geological, meteorological, and astrono astronomical changes like these alter environments and make new things advantageous to the living things in them. I originally wrote animals in there, but expanded it to the larger concept of living things because, of course, plants and other kingdoms of life evolve as well. We will not be talking about plant evolution tonight, though, because plant evolution creates weird, scary monsters almost never. <laughs> but sometimes. <laughs> And so, for example, a few million years ago, a large part of African jungle gives way to savanna, and so the apes of the area evolve a bipedal running stance. This puts the skull on the top of the body, supported by all of it, which gives this, the skull room to grow. And as it becomes advantageous for the ape to become a problem solver, it does so, and it comes eventually to produce <laughs> tools, culture, and ultimately, she's the sheriff. <laughs> This hints at another basic principle, which is that evolution works with what it's got. Uprightness produced the possibility of brain growth in apes, whereas pangolins are unlikely to evolve beautiful feathery wings, or at least not soon. And so, yeah. And so, the responsible speculative evolutionist does not deal in feather winged pangolins. But, disappointing though that clearly is, <laughs> imagining what evolution might produce under imaginary but realistic conditions can produce a glorious array of monsters and beasts. Speculative evolution is simply a variety of creature design, a human pastime for tens of thousands of years, just one where attention is paid to evolution and ecology, one where form follows function. It is generally held that speculative evolution as a specific concept began with the 1981 book After Man, A Zoology of the Future by Scottish scientist Dougal Dixon. I will be dealing primarily in books on speculative evolution tonight because I am, of course, 1,000 years old. <laughs> provides a worldwide catalog of species in a world 50 million years in the future, in which humanity has been extinct pretty much all of that time, taking most of the large animals on Earth with it. He starts, therefore, with the Rabbox and Predator Rats, the former being rabbits evolved into the ecological niches of deer and antelopes and such, and the latter being rats evolved to be the planet's primary large carnivores. They're part rat, part wolf, <coughs> something for everyone, really. <laughs> this all is A, awesome, totally wicked, <laughs> and be surprisingly plausible and based on a number of sound evolutionary principles. When an ecological niche, medium-sized running herbivores, for example, or the animals that eat them, is vacated for whatever reason by extinction, other animals evolve into it. It's like being promoted at work, except animals don't keep doing it until they get jobs that they're terrible at. <laughs> Rats and rabbits are excellent choices for this for a variety of reasons. For one, they breed quickly with large litters starting at young ages, giving more opportunities for beneficial mutations and a faster turnover rate for passing them on. 
Time-wise, evolution is measured in generations, and the shorter these are, the faster it happens. This is actually part of why it's hard for some people to imagine evolution. Human generational turnover is among the slowest in the world, whereas ba bacteria develop antibiotic-resistant strains before our very eyes because their lives are so short. <laughs> but they live them to the fullest, and that's what counts. <laughs> And rats also work because they're generalists, animals that can eat a lot of different foods and a lot of different habitats, and it's the generalists that do best in mass extinction events, and, um, and it's the generalists who do best in the mass extinction events, mass extinction events like us, by which I mean us in this room. <laughs> Other animals are specialists living only in extreme environments or eating only eucalyptus or bamboo or oh. cocoa puffs. <laughs> And of course, when something happens to their environment or food source, that may well be it for them. There are whole species of mollusks that live entirely on whale carcasses that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean. One time I worked for an insurance company. You do what you've got to do. <laughs> but rats and rabbits are everywhere. Rats walk down the streets in New York City. There are rabbits in my backyard right now. It's my backyard. They don't care. <laughs> Some rabbits can even outwit ducks. <laughs> they are survivors. In the rabbits and predator rats, which have arctic forms and come in various sizes and so on, we also see the principle of adaptive radiation, which is not when radiation makes things evolve. Radiation does not happen to have created any beneficial mutations so far as has been observed, but I do like to think we are not observing hard enough. <laughs> Rather, <laughs> adaptive Useful. Rather, adaptive radiation describes the process by which a single species evolves into multiple open ecological niches. Darwin's observation of finches on the Galapagos Islands, largely identical but with a variety of different beaks to feed on a variety of different foods, led him to conclude that this, that this existed and prompted him to develop his theory. Finches. Science. We all wish it was like this, but then we all wish a lot of things. <laughs> The rabbits are hooved, and the rats have sleek, powerful, wolfish bodies, and this all is exemplary of convergent evolution, which is an extremely important concept tonight. This is the thylacine, a recently extinct animal from Tasmania, and it is clearly a sort of dog, except no, it isn't. It is a marsupial, cl as closely related to the canines as it is to giraffes or whales or what have you. But it evolved dog-like features because it lived a dog-like lifestyle and had a mammal's set of and had a mammal's set of features to evolve into that lifestyle. That's convergent evolution, unrelated animals evolving the same things to live the same lives. A similar concept is parallel evolution, where related, animal, where related animals evolve the same things separately. It's basically the same as convergent evolution, except the animals were already related anyway, and nobody is really impressed. <laughs> Humans and orangutans, for example, both separately evolved the capacity from the same genetic stock to walk in a straight-legged, upright posture. Now, those who have seen my show before know that that was the most movement it's had in years. <laughs> the monster science equivalent of Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> Don't get used to it. A northern variety of predator rat, the Bartolot, has saber teeth kept in a sort of pouch. It's a good look here, though there are those who have proposed that prehistoric saber-toothed cats, normally depicted thusly, also had pouches for their teeth, and the people who proposed this, I hate them. I hate them so much. Now, if all of this future evolution sounds absurd and implausible to you, please be advised that it happened before in an even more extreme manner. Once a group of species of small nocturnal mammals, ecologically rats and shrews, took advantage of the vacating of quite a few ecological niches and eventually became elephants and dolphins and bats and David Schwimmer and all, <laughs> all kinds of glorious things like that. 
And so, this impossibility of imagining that Mesozoic mammals would develop into rhinos or share means that one can go ahead, one can go ahead and get weird with speculative evolution. And so Dick Dixon does this. Surviving antelope's horns evolve into full head coverings, even replacing the front upper teeth as plant shearing devices. Various insectivores convergently evolve bird features. The reed stilt is a mammal heron, and the true teal developing a beak made out of its teeth to stab down at burrowing invertebrates, which it detects by holding its enormous ears to the ground. The penguins evolve into the niche of the cetaceans, with the big ones re replicating the baleen that whales use to filter krill from water, with a system of thin holes in the beak, filtering its food by rising up of, out of the water and letting the water spill out. In Africa, the primates become the big predators, and it's all very weird, but no weirder than what's gone before. For example, and I'm only going to do this once, prehensile-tailed porcupine, gliding snake, <laughs> Bird-eating spider. <laughs> Peacock, for God's sake. <laughs> All real. Evolution does what it likes. Elsewhere, other evolutionary principles are demonstrated. A string of islands called the Pacaos is thrown up in the Pacific and is colonized by present-day Australian golden whistlers, a type of songbird. And as in the Galapagos finches, they radiate out into various ecological niches, but the more so here with hawk and woodpecker and other forms besides. The little screaming squirrel there, let's all take a moment to feel badly for it. <laughs> Thank you. It's unleashing its tail, shaped in pattern to look like a snake, and a principle called Batesian mimicry, where an animal evolves in whole or in part to look like a more dangerous animal. Another set of new Pacific islands, Batavia, is colonized not by birds, as new islands typically are at first, but by bats, and this, it seems, causes the wheels to come off. Not, not only do they radiate into all the flying niches, but also into te terrestrial and aquatic ones as well. The surf bat becomes a kind of seal. The fluor modifies its huge, weird bat nose and ear flaps to resemble a local flower and hence attract insects to eat. Stupid, stupid insects to eat. <laughs> and the night stalker evolves into this. Walking on its front legs. <laughs> Walking on its front legs because that's where the locomotion muscles were concentrated in its ancestors and looking like it does generally because evolution hates you and wants you to be unhappy. <laughs> there are a lot of mammal bipeds in Dixon's future, the most of them walking on their hind legs like decent Christian folk. <laughs> the raboons, some of the predatory monkeys we saw earlier do it. The South American strix do it, and their relatives, the wakas, do it so hard they've lost their forelegs entirely, leaving them looking like animals from outer space, except animals from outer space probably wouldn't look like that. We will get to that shortly. <laughs> That's foreshadowing. Leaving the audience wanting more. <laughs> this all is the more remarkable because mammals rarely evolve bipedalism, and when they do, it is almost always with a hopping motion rather than a walking one, as in jerboas, who can hear you, by the way, <laughs> and kangaroos. Among the few exceptions to this are you guys, so, I don't know, nice work. <laughs> and also pangolins, who have also evolved waiting politely. <laughs> We have discussed evolution as prompted by changes in the Earth itself, but it also has a cascading effect. Another part of the environment to which evolution might respond is the other animals in that environment. This is demonstrated here by the Striger, a cat that evolves to exploit the previously safe environment of the trees. By taking on a monkey-like body, it can hunt monkeys on their own terms, forcing them to change as a result. The Kiffa above develops armor and claws, and the Klatta, an, an armored prehensile tail from which it hangs when in danger, leaving only the armored part vulnerable on the branch. In the Arctic Circle, there are flightless auks, basically northern penguins, and these represent the concept of ring species, such as this, the modern situation of the European herring gull and the lesser black-backed gull. Now, the herring gull, which is named after its food, not because it is part herring, alas, <laughs> can breed with its western neighbors, the American herring gull, which can breed with gulls to its west, and so on all around the Arctic Circle, until you get to lesser black-backed gulls just to the east of the European herring gulls, which cannot breed with them. And so what you have is a gradient of relationships, each population of gull related to its neighbors, until you get far enough that the relationship becomes distant. So it is with the future flightless ox, and so it is with evolution itself. 
Everything alive is related by matters of grade and spectrum if you look at it through history. The seeming gulfs between the species are simply where they happen to be now. Evolution shows us that everything alive is of a blood, and that doesn't mean some of it isn't super gross. But, <laughs> but it's still a beautiful idea. <laughs> There are dozens more animals in after man, but alas, we must move on. I will simply I will simply mention that I can find no information about this picture. And I don't know what a scratch model is, but this whole thing is apparently Japanese, which makes sense because they are the best at weird animals. In fact, the word kaiju, usually taken this these days to mean a giant city wrecking monster, in fact means literally unusual animal. The Japanese have a whole word for that. It is the best. <laughs> anyway, the point is, if you bring one of these to me intact, whatever it is, I will give you $5,000. <laughs> I don't have $5,000. I will rob a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> For science. <laughs> Little known fact, over 70% of liquor store robberies are actually for science. <laughs> Another look at future evolution appeared in 2002's The Future is Wild, a British pseudo-documentary television miniseries in which computer-generated footage of speculative future animals is played over and over again in each episode, and it is extremely frustrating to watch. <laughs> this is no doubt due to budgetary constraints, because people don't throw a lot of money at documentaries about pretend future animals animals, and they do throw a lot of money at, let's say, the Meg, and I do not understand the world. <laughs> Advised by a team of scientists, including Dixon himself, this series has far fewer animals, but stretches them out over three different time frames, 5 million, 100 million, and 200 million years hence. The one 5 million years out is an ice age, and is of course the most recognizable to us. It has giant saber-toothed wolverines, which is of course amazing, yeah. and death gleaners, which are huge predatory bats, and basically the moral of this is evolution is just waiting until we're gone to bust out the really metal animals. <laughs> Science. <laughs> In South America, the giving away of forest to grassland makes the monies, the monies, the monkeys even, <laughs> into running quadrupeds, much as once happened with the baboons in Africa. I have mentioned that apes reacted to the same change by becoming upright, and this allowed for larger brains, but this did not come without disadvantages. For one, the birth canal, now sandwiched tightly between the legs rather than aimed out perpendicularly as in most mammals, became much thinner, resulting in painful childbirth and babies being born at a much lower level of development than, other, than in other animals. In biblical times, when people hung around goats a lot, both because of farming reasons and because goats are nice. <laughs> human and animal birth were general knowledge, and so there's a thing in Genesis where women are cursed by God with painful births because of Eve's sin of curiosity, and uh, that'll teach you, I guess. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not seeing the point, Mr. God. <laughs> Scrofas are pig descendants, and indeed pigs and pig-like animals, like rats and rabbits, are excellent generalists. Indeed, a sort of lizard-pig proto-mammal called Lystrosaurus survived the largest mass extinction in the history of the Earth 251 million years ago. And in the time after this extinction, there exist fossil beds in which 95% of land vertebrates are Lystrosauruses. It was a zombie apocalypse of pig lizards. It was the worst time in the history of life on Earth. <laughs> the caracara, a very handsome South American bird of prey, evolves into a flightless apex predator, not unlike the enormous, completely awesome forest rakids of prehistory, called the caraciller, proving once again that people are terrible at naming animals. <laughs> Here we have the dick sizzle. Here we have the great tit. I had to do this image search very carefully. <laughs> Heavy, prolonged sigh. So, let's jump ahead to 100 million years from now, where time, heat, and oxygen content have made things weird. Still, there are some callbacks to ancient forms. Tauratons resemble sauropod dinosaurs, but are larger still. They can grow to even greater sizes because they are turtles and hence cold-blooded and do not need to conserve heat. 
The Great Blue Windrunner, which is a lovely name. Presumably the second choice was Penis Bird Penis Penis. <laughs> has four wings with a full set of flight feathers on the legs. And at the time this was made, the scientists were just being weird, as scientists will do. But the very next year, a feathered dinosaur Microraptor was described, and it had the same feature. Its leg wings were bigger, though. And of course, as a dinosaur, it had teeth and a long, bony tail. And speculative evolution is my second favorite sort of monster after dinosaurs for pretty much exactly this sort of reason. <laughs> they later figured out that Microraptor was glossy black like a crow. It is so, so beautiful. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> There's the falconfly, a giant dragonfly, and call back to Meganura, a 28-inch wingspan dragonfly from 300 million years ago when the world was warm and oxygen-rich in a way that this program proposes the Earth will again be. The main difference here is that in the falconfly's time, birds exist, and it can catch them mid-flight, and again, I am so, so happy. <laughs> One thing that does not exist in any numbers would be mammals, represented here only by the Poggle, one of the last representatives of the class, no longer relevant in an overheated world. Poggles live in the nests of giant spiders and steal their cached food, which doesn't sound amazing to some, but frankly, I'd send in a resume. <laughs> Even if I had to upload it and then describe all my work history separately. <laughs> And then, there are swampuses, cephalopods that spend a lot of their time on land. And if you know anything about cephalopods, that they are astonishingly intelligent, and of course covered with tentacles, you know where this is going. Not, not horn. <laughs> not that way. No, yeah. No, instead, 200 million years from now, with all the continents smashed together into a new Pangea, we get mega squid, huge walking squid, root of a vaguely... Elephante niche and squibbins, agile, brachiating cephalopods. Squibbins again. I take back what I said earlier about scientists and naming things. There are also fish, which are fish evolved to be primarily airborne. Get it? Flying fish. Flish. Okay. I take back the taking back. But getting back to the squibbins, it is implied that their intelligence might be developing further, and they could someday become the second civilized, sentient life form on Earth. They could only do better than the first. Also, bring me this. Stephen Baxter's 2003 novel Evolution tracks the history of life on Earth through a series of chapters each set millions of years from the previous, and these include parts set in the future. The primary one, set 30 million years from now, is unabashedly similar to After Man, actionably so, frankly. There are Rabbix and Predator Rats, albeit by their names. There are Hornheads, Whales evolved from Seabirds, Eagles evolved from Finches, the works. But there is one place where he diverges from our last two. Humans are around or rather their descendants. Human consciousness has ceased to be advantageous, and boy, I know the feeling. <laughs> and our descendants have spread into a number of niches, none more intelligent than a great ape, and most much less so. There are two kinds of arboreal humans, one a generalist and one a predator. Our story is told from the point of view of one of the former, as it, as it is still the most human of the various species. Certainly, more human-like than the tiny, hairless, eyeless, clawed, burrowing post-humans who live in colonies and symbiosis with a kind of tree. Certainly more human-like than the huge, heavy, knuckle-walking, especially unintelligent humans, which are managed in a sort of instinctive herding and shepherding behavior by mouse descendants that have evolved into enormous bipedal tyrannosaur analogs. <laughs> This may all sound kind of degrading to the noble human spirit, our centuries of glorious artistic and intellectual accomplishments, and there's a reason for that. It is. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> this is because evolution doesn't actually give a darn about the noble human spirit. I like the Sistine Chapel and Thundercats and stuff as much as the next guy. <laughs> But in evolutionary terms, these are contributions to our psychological well-being at best and waste material at worst, with a stop off at the Freudian concept of anything anybody ever does when they're not eating and sleeping is an effort to attract a mate. On the one hand, quite a lot of animal behavior does seem to be for this purpose. On the other hand, Thundercats. <laughs> also the Meg. 
<laughs> Moreover, now that our sort of intelligence is here, we have exempted ourselves from the evolutionary process. We no longer develop new traits to adapt to our environments, because of course we can adapt our environments to us. In the last few thousand years, humans have gotten a little larger, and blondness has developed and proliferated for the evolutionary reason, and this is speaking in terms of scientific animal behaviorism, that blondes have more fun. <laughs> also, how many blondes does it take to screw in a light bulb? Oh, grow up. <laughs> And so, our man Doodle Dixon does something remarkable in his 1990 book, Man After Man. He starts future human evolution by, making, by having us in the future genetically design a number of new forms of human. This doesn't feel like evolution proper, but technically speaking, just because genetic, evolution, genetic alteration leading to speciation is done on purpose, doesn't make it not evolution. The wilderness does not feature the domestic dog species, or cows. These were created by humans with selective breeding, and they still count as having evolved from their ancestors. And certainly, once we can tinker with our own bodies reliably, we will. Humanity does not tend to develop technologies and then decide, well, whatever. <laughs> Indeed, there's even a term for this future of human alteration invented by the sorts of people who invent such terms. Transhumanism, the eventual ability to control and alter our own bodies. Me? I'll be going for this. <laughs> It is difficult to imagine that people would alter themselves in the manners that Dixon suggests, however. We deliberately remove consciousness from ourselves, and I've had some bad days, but this seems like a strong choice. <laughs> this plains running post-human is, judging by the mustache, also engineered to be a building superintendent. <laughs> the many evolutionary advantages thereof. And then the sentient humans die off and the dim-witted engineered ones survive and come to be subject to ordinary evolutionary pressures. One pair of species in which a small nimble one does the food gathering for both and is transported and kept warm by a large shaggy species eventually evolves into out-and-out -out parasitism. And look, look, I am on record multiple times is saying that I think humans are a cancer on the planet, that the world would be better off without us, but this just makes me want to cry. <laughs> At the end of the book, humans who have left Earth ages ago return, themselves altered outside of recognizability, and turn some of the local post-humans into giant piles of living meat. Telepathy shows up. Basically, this is less an exercise in speculative evolution and one more of soft sci-fi body horror. There are also allegations that it was plagiarized from the artist Wayne Barlow. Basically, Man After Man is Dixon's Phantom Menace, where After Man was his Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Moving to our final Biggle Dixon book, we get to the one between his Empire Strikes Back and his Phantom Menace, which is to say, his Return of the Jedi. Worthwhile, but not without serious flaws. <laughs> Make your science talk relatable to modern audiences? Check. <laughs> This is The New Dinosaurs, an alternative evolution from 1984, and this gives us another, also very popular variety of speculative evolution, what would the world be like now if the dinosaurs had never died out? Short answer, a million times better in every possible way. <laughs> Long answer, well that's what this book is about. It is certainly not the first proposal about modern dinosaur survival. 20th century literature and cinema is replete, replete. <laughs> with lost worlds named after the Arthur Conan Doyle st story of that name that are loaded with dinosaurs that have survived for 65 million years. Unchanged. They are always exactly like fossil dinosaurs, and that is A, not how evolution works, and B, boring. So boring. <laughs> I mean, look at the alternative, the very title of Dixon's work, New Dinosaurs. Come on! <laughs> now, as mentioned, this book is not without its problems. So are products of the time. He evolves some small theropods into arborosaurs, agile tree-climbing animals, some with gliding scales or flaps of skin. We now know that theropods were feathered and really more like birds than we'd previously imagined, and so really, these would just have bird wings. And some are inexplicable, like a surviving megalosaurus, whereas in our dimension, megalosaurus went extinct 160 million years ago, almost 100 million years before the dinosaurs in general. But for all this, where this book is good, it's great. The monocorn, a ceratopsian bison, is striking and bizarre, yet still familiar. Its partial shag look also works on the taranter, though it is a look that you really have to own, you know? <laughs> 
the crack beak is a tree adapted herbivorous ornithopod and winds up being a sort of combination of an ape and a hornbill, and that is amazing. The harridan doesn't really look like real pterosaurs. Real pterosaurs are quadrupeds and lack grasping feet, but it's nothing 65 million years of evolution couldn't handle, and the result is awfully handsome. Like George Clooney. <laughs> or not like that at all. <laughs> The springe has a mottled rotten look and hunts by distending its stomach to look bloated like a recently dead animal. And it lies on the ground waiting for scavengers to happen by, which it then slaughters with the killing claw on its foot. I'm not aware of a living animal that hunts in this manner, but it seems completely plausible and also weird and gross. <laughs> the cutlass tooth is a sort of saber-toothed theropod specialized for cutting up sauropods. And I didn't mention it when I was talking about man after man, but that book has a saber-toothed post-human. And the moral of that is that Dixon loves saber teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so. And so does evolution. Apart from the famous cats, the real history of Earth life has included saber-toothed marsupials, saber-toothed pre-dinosaur lizard dogs. Saber teeth are a popular evolutionary option. And the fact that we live in a time without any such animals is just more proof that God does not love us. <laughs> <laughs> but my own favorite animal in this book is actually the Sprintosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs adapted to be plains runners, some with huge, long, warning flag tails. I can't quite put my finger on why I like them so well. They retain their dinosaurness without, while going in a completely different direction, deeply weird yet very plausible seeming, as it is in all the best creature design of any type. Also, they look like they'd take a saddle pretty well. <laughs> there are more dinosaurs to be had here, of course, and that's good, because otherwise alternative dinosaur evolution is distressingly underrepresented. The only other major book about it is 2005's The World of Kong, A Natural History of Skull Island, of all things, a tie-in to Peter Jackson's version of the film. But it's a full-scale speculative evolution book with dozens and dozens of animals with scientific names and ecological notes organized by habitat. Now, admittedly, some of the creature design consists of how many more spikes could we cram on this thing until it just looked like some sort of pointy explosion. <laughs> here's their stegosaur, and here's the main ceratopsian, which, I will note, is not based on triceratops, but rather, rather on pachyrhinosaurus, a deep cut. A B-side of a dinosaur. No doubt included for the dinosaur hipsters, the people who knew about Pachyrhinosaurus before it sold out. <laughs> but they also get creative. Starting sticking with the Ceratopsians, we get small, agile running forms, and it's delightful. And it's at its best when it does this kind of good weirdness. The carrion parrots are fun, as is the Diablosaurus, a sauropod convergently evolved to resemble an armored ankylosaur. Bat wings are almost as popular as spikes on the island. Amphibians evolve them. Rodents, rather than bats, evolve them. Theropod dinosaurs evolve them. Indeed, it is noted that the theropods now evolve powered flight twice here and in the birds. Now, there are words that have no place here. Words like plausible, likely, scientifically responsible, <laughs> and so on. Bat wings don't evolve constantly. There are way, way too many species of predator on this island. Dinosaurs should have feathers, and we do know this by now, and so on. This is clearly creature design for a major motion picture, but it does tip its hat constantly to science, if in a freewheeling sort of way. And for that, it gets the Reverend Matt personal stamp of approval. And the movie they were designed for, of course, uses exactly zero of them. <laughs> Instead, it focuses on the designs that have barely any design at all, the tyrannosaur type, the raptor type, the brontosaur type. All to keep things unchallenging from movie audiences who, as every Hollywood executive is plainly totally certain, are spectacularly stupid idiots of the most blithering kind. It's a miracle we don't just run into things constantly. <laughs> Still, if this were this movie's only problem, I would forgive it that. Don't even get me started about the Hobbit movies. <laughs> but, you look for my talk, Peter Jackson, I Hate You, I Hate You, <laughs> coming in autumn 2019. This is the story of alternative dinosaur evolution in print. Perhaps the best alternative dino dinosaur evolution is one found online, called simply the Speculative Dinosaur Project, in which a group of students and artists have designed their own modern world in which the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct. And it is exquisite, full of the crossroads between the believable and the creative that we have celebrated here. 
The science is good, the dinosaurs are feathered, the art is wonderful, and it has saber-toothed tyrannosaurs. So, you know, who cares about all that other stuff? Some ceratopsians' cheekbones have become tusks. There are polar bear raptors. There are running hadrosaurs with insane crests. If somebody made a virtual reality version of it where you could immersively live in this world, I would use it all the time and starve to death. You cannot stop me. It is my destiny. <laughs> Our third and final major category of speculative evolution is the extraterrestrial. People have been imagining extraterrestrial life for as long as they have realized that the lights in the sky were places, and most of this imagining has taken the form of more humans, sometimes with slightly unusual facial features, or even coloration. <laughs> This is, of course, the most colossal failure of imagination in the entire millennia-long history of people imagining anything ever. <laughs> the modern result of an entirely separate history of evolution in completely different circumstances than those on Earth, completely different even if the planet is utterly Earth-like, because the history of our world is one of countless tiny changes on one end and mass extinctions on the other. And so right here with our planet, things could have gone countless other ways. On other planets, it winds up with white people. <laughs> and even besides the fact that life on Earth is an absurd conglomeration of random chance, alien planets are, of course, going to be alien. Some of, their some of their differences are easy to guess at, but no less profound for it. Gravity will vary, and atmospheric content, and amount of water. Some are subtler. The rotation time of a planet and the thickness of its atmosphere would determine how much the temperature would vary during a day. Life could evolve in a place with little or no light, creating blind animals with no concept of visual things. If you know what this is, you are a huge nerd. <laughs> if you can recite its version of the Green Lantern Oath, you are either noted local comic book artist Christopher Jones or myself. <laughs> On. Coming up with this sort of thing is basically a writing prompt exercise for a beginning level science fiction writer's club. And you can come up with an entirely different list of ways in which life could develop differently regardless of huge, obvious differences in the planet it develops on. So much of life on Earth is bilaterally symmetrical, but then some of it isn't. It is thought that this symmetry was developed because it helps things to swim fast. But what if environmental pressure never made that a priority, or it was made to happen another way? Cephalopods propel themselves with siphons. Large life on Earth is divided mostly into plants and animals, but this is just another way that things happen to have gone, and perhaps no such divide appears in other worlds. This is basic stuff, foundational, things that happened hundreds of millions of years ago. Senses are another giant mess. Cats have senses that we lack. It helps make them so graceful and majestic. <laughs> Aliens could sense electromagnetism or infrared or ultraviolet light, as many Earth animals do. They could lead with smell so heavily that if they were intelligent, they would think of things entirely in gradients rather than the human tendency to binary thinking. The odds are extremely good that we literally cannot imagine what alien life would be like. And that brings us to alien intelligence. Perhaps it doesn't think in binary because of its senses, or perhaps all kinds of stuff. Human intelligence is made up of a huge number of different processes, memory, associations, predictive thought, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, thinking about snacks, and so <laughs> forth. And alien intelligence could have less of any of these, or more of them, perhaps to levels we literally cannot imagine. Look. I love Star Trek. I own the entire original series and Next Generation on Blu-ray because, again, old. I have, I have sophisticated opinions about Spock and Q, but its aliens are terrible and insult to the imagination that we are told is being celebrated. They are often defended as looking that way because that way the viewer can sympathize with them. But now we just have a failure of compassion instead, an insistence on only feeling for entities that look like us. I'm a grumpy old man about Star Trek, and it may surprise you to learn, single. <laughs> now, first, there's the question of whether our imaginations and compassion will ever be challenged by real alien life. This is too big a question for us to address here. Suffice it to say, life itself is a chemical reaction of some sort, and it appears that bacteria can survive almost anywhere. And so it seems increasingly likely that we live in a universe swimming in bacteria, but, and this is important, who cares? <laughs> the development of intelligence will there the odds are rather long. But 
There are estimated to be up to 100,000 million stars in our galaxy and 2 trillion galaxies in the observable universe. Somewhere out there, there is a planet whose inhabitants are all made out of fine cheeses. They communicate by singing Smash Mouth's rock star in different pitches. <laughs> With these numbers, the odds demand it. We just probably will never meet them as all, both because of the impossible gulfs of space involved and because of how we are. Speaking of enormous numbers, <laughs> speaking of enormous numbers, I of course am not even going to begin to give an overview of alien life proposals. Most of them have little to do with speculative evolution anyway. Their designs are put together in order to elicit a reaction from the viewer, though it is sometimes difficult to determine what exactly they're going for, with no real consideration as to how or why they might have evolved in their environment. There are a handful of exceptions, though. Perhaps the best one comes from 1980's Our Universe, a general guide to what was then known about astronomy put out by the National Geographic Society. This contained a four-page section with six imaginary animals living on the other planets of our solar system. On Saturn's thickly atmosphered moon Titan, we find stove bellies who keep fire fires burning inside of them by consuming ice and also methane from Titan's atmosphere and occasionally burn off excess by launching themselves into the air via a ventral orifice. <laughs> the Martian water seeker has a tail that shades it in the burning Martian day, giant ears that cocoon it in the freezing Martian night, and ridiculously thin limbs due to Mars, Mars's low gravity. Brinker Roos skate across the surface of Jupiter's ice moon Europa, getting their energy from photosynthesis and collecting it from Jupiter's magnetic field via the rings on their backs. Why this would necessitate their skating around at all is unrevealed. <laughs> but I love these creatures, and I don't want to be snarky here. <laughs> Plutonian Zissels, highly intelligent crystal, crystal beings, are presumably silicon-based life rather than carbon-based, as silicon is the other element with the correct properties to form life around. Oucher Pouchers on Venus eat rock and metal and continually shift from foot to foot because of the heat of Venus's surface. And Jelly Blimps and Sword Tails live constantly airborne lives on Jupiter, where there is, of course, no land. The point of all these is obvious, to determine what conditions are like on their respective planets. And creatures made for their environments is what evolution is all about, including pretend evolution. I was going to say something here about how the human imagination is as boundless as outer space itself, but I'm not going to, because that's stupid. <laughs> the gulfs of space and time beggar human comprehension. But we have a way of dealing with the unfathomable nevertheless, and that is science. And when science pairs with imagination, things get amazing. There's a Goya etching entitled, The Sleep of Reason Begets Monsters. But in the case of speculative evolution, it is the awakening of reason that begets monsters. And that is why it is the best. Thank you. Uh, so this is part of, as most of you probably know, this is part of an ongoing series I have called Reverend Matt's Monster Science. Uh, I, I have a, a late night show every month here at the Phoenix, and I do it at libraries and all over the place. And it's, it's an enormous labor of, of love for me. It is what I'm on earth to do, um, tell jokes about manticores and stuff. And, um, and, it, and it, is, it is just a beam of light in my life. It is, it, is, it is wonderful that I get to do this and that people come. And enjoy it. And the history of it was that I started it in a show called the Encyclopedia Show over at Kieran's. We had an example of it here last night. Um, and then I would do it in little 10 minute snippets, and that was how it got its start. But the first time I ever did a, and now my Monster Science is all an hour long, but the first time I ever did one that was more than 10 minutes was I had half an hour in the second Die Laughing Marathon. Um, and I did a thing called 28 Godzilla movies in 28 minutes, and uh, <laughs> and, and I've done and, and, and so that was that was my first break, I, and I was super nervous about doing it longer than 10 minutes, and uh, and so it was it was a very important step in uh, in the development of, of my little show, and now my little show is 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 uh, is the greatest source of happiness in my life. Um, so so uh, I'd make fun of you for that, but for real. Um, and, um, and, and, and I have Fearless Comedy Productions and this festival in particular uh, to thank for its development. So thank you for being here and donate money. <laughs> Did you
Thank you very much, Reverend Max. Go for science! Woo!